Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Ken Brown. I'm with Transportation Energy Partners, and I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar. Um, uh, we're going to focus right now. There's a um, Despite what you see on uh, TV all, all the time, um, there are things going on in Washington, uh, despite all of the uh, uh, distractions related to impeachment and everything else. So we're going to give you an update on a whole range of uh, policies um, related to alternative fuels and vehicles. Um, before we get started, um, I want to give a thank you to all of our many sponsors who help make our work possible. Um, we really appreciate your support. Um, I also, uh, these are our 2019 sponsors. Many of you have renewed for 2020. Um, and for those of you who haven't yet renewed, there's still time. And for those of you uh, who want to join in and sponsor as sponsors, please uh, get in touch with me and we can uh, include you for our upcoming uh, Energy Independence Summit. Um, we have a uh, star-studded uh, panel of speakers today. Um, uh, some of the leading uh, experts on alternative fuels and vehicles from uh, the top organizations um, across the country. Um, so you got the you got the best and the brightest with us today. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Transportation Energy Partners works with uh, the nation's 90 uh, clean cities coalitions and our 15,000 stakeholders. We focus on uh, keeping coalitions and stakeholders informed of key federal policies, programs, and funding opportunities that we work to uh, educate policymakers about the importance of advancing markets for cleaner fuels and vehicles. Um, briefly, some of our recent accomplishments. Um, in terms of the Clean Cities program, we had success last year in increasing funding up to nearly 40 million. Um, it's been bumped up another four and a half million in the House version of uh, this year's appropriations bill, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. I um, uh, want to thank all of you across the country and all of the organization, national organizations with us as speakers today for joining in our effort to uh, defeat uh, an amendment that uh, sought to defund the Clean Cities Program. Um, we had a massive outcry and they didn't even offer the amendment because it would have um, been defeated so overwhelmingly. Um, uh, we've been working very closely with the Department of Energy to increase uh, direct support funding for the coalitions. We increased it in 2019, um, and hopefully we may get another small increase for FY 2020. We also worked with DOE to uh, improve the uh, competitive grant solicitation so that it would be a better fit um, with coalitions uh, strengths and abilities and as a result a number of clean cities coalitions were winners of the competitive grants this year some of as uh, a number as prime uh, uh, grantees and then a number uh, of you were also part of the teams as sub grantees so um, we worked very hard uh, to uh, May improve the grants process so that Clean Cities coalitions could better uh, take advantage of being recipients of those grants. Um, and uh, some of the things we're going to talk about today, we've all also worked with Congress to increase funding for the EPA diesel emission reduction grants. Um, we've worked closely with our industry partners um, in the campaign to extend the uh, in tax incentives, which you'll hear more about shortly, um, same on the renewable fuel standard. Um, and we've also been working with uh, the Department of Transportation and Congress to um, to fix the CMAC program um, so that that program can continue funding uh, clean vehicle projects. Um, I think as most of you know, our uh, annual Energy Independence Summit is coming up uh, in February. 
um, on the 10th through the 12th. Um, it's a great event. Uh, we need you in DC to show support for all the, all the policies that we're working on and fighting for. We'll have administration and congressional leaders. We'll talk about federal funding opportunities, top industry folks who will be there. We'll have uh, roundtable discussions with DOE, EPA, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, uh, uh, Department of Defense, and others. There will be a Salute to Clean Cities reception. On Capitol Hill Day, we'll have uh, at least 250 meetings with congressional offices. We'll all divide up into teams, and everybody will participate in those meetings, and they have a tremendous impact. Um, and then every year we have our reception hosted by UPS on Capitol Hill, which is great fun and a great opportunity to network. So um, registration is open. Go to our website um, and click on the registration bar. Uh, the early bird deadline is coming up soon. Hotel rooms are going fast. Um, and if we're going to continue to be successful in fighting for more money and getting the tax incentives extended, we need you all in D.C. to talk about um, why these policies and programs and funding are so important uh, to communities across the country, because that's really what makes the difference with members of Congress. So please uh, join us for the summit in D.C. this year. Um, I'm going to skip over this. I'm just going to talk about just briefly. I think the key points are that the, the bipartisan support for alternative fuels and vehicles remains strong. Um, obviously, the Congress is distracted and the administration by all of the uh, impeachment proceedings. Um, in addition, obviously, the the 2020 election will have a big impact on what happens the rest of this year and next year. Um, but it's an important year to continue our work, um, both in Washington and with uh, um, people running for office around the country. Um, our top priorities, which we're going to get into, um, uh, uh, remain the same. Um, and we're going to talk about all these items. So those are the introductory remarks, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Allison Cunningham, who's with NGV America, who's going to um, talk about the, the tax incentives, the status of the tax incentives for alternative fuels and vehicles. Allison, thanks for uh, joining us. Sure. Thank you, Ken. Uh, as Ken mentioned, my name is Allison Cunningham, and I am Director of Federal Government Affairs for NGV America. NGV America is the National Trade Association. We work on the increased use of natural gas in transportation. We have approximately 180 member companies across the country, everything from fleets, transit agencies, fuelers, OEMs, local distribution companies, and clean cities coalition members such as yourselves. Our organization's biggest federal priority is extension of the alternative fuels tax credit. Uh, as such, we have convened a coalition of lobbyists from all eligible fuels under that, you see LNG, CNG, uh, propane, hydrogen fuel, and a handful of others. And we really aggressively pursued the AFTC extension. Um, as you see on the slide, it expired at the end of 2017, as did uh, some of these other credits as well. They're in a group of credits that we call tax extenders because they have been extended either short term or retroactively or off and on. Uh, so they all generally ride together as they have in years past. Um, so those are all included there. And so we have been working all year to try to get those uh, extended. Very, very um, unclear path forward at the moment. Uh, but go ahead and move that forward. Thank you. Um, there are also a set of credits that are due to expire at the end of 2019. And so those are starting to become part of that conversation as well. So while we continue to have uncertainty about uncertainty about the prognosis for a year-end tax agreement. There has been movement on a variety of tax bills so far this year. Tax extenders, including all the fuel-related extenders, were addressed in both chambers, including in S-617, the grassley widened tax extender bill uh, in the House. They were largely included. All the fuels were included. There were a few exceptions out of the um, extender list left off, left off of H.R. 3301 
was Chairman Neal's tax extender bill. Additionally, House Ways and Means Democrats recently introduced the Green Act discussion draft. Uh, this bill included clean trans. So there are also various standalone bills for specific credits that are going around. Um, I'll allow someone else on biodiesel to speak to their bill, but in recent weeks, NGV America succeeded in the introduction of an um, alt fuels tax credit standalone bill that is HR 5089. And it was uh, introduced by Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher of Texas and Congressman Mark Van Mullen from Oklahoma. The bill extends AFTC for 2018 and 2019 extends it forward for five years and phases it down for two years at 25 cents a gallon. Um, this bill underscores the need for a forward-looking long-term AFTC extension. And it also demonstrates that supporters of this credit have an industry-approved phase down, that we don't necessarily want to keep the credit extended forever. So we will continue to gain co-sponsors for the bill and would appreciate engagement in the form of advocacy from any participants on this call that would like to become involved in that. We'd be glad to speak with you or and have my contact information available if you'd like to join that. Uh, so next slide, there we go. Uh, as you may recall in the past, if you've participated in some of TEP's uh, webinars, we've discussed some of the key congressional leadership on tax policy, uh, includes Chairman Grassley of Iowa, Ranking Member Wyden of Oregon, and Chairman Neal of Massachusetts, and Kevin Brady from Texas. Um, I would say the only outlier in this group of um, the four corners, as they're called, would be Ranking Member Kevin Brady, because he is the least supportive of getting tax extenders taken care of. Um, Grassley is a strong supporter of biodiesel and has been very vocally supportive of moving these tax credits. Um, Wyden and Neal both see value in moving these extenders because it includes several Democrat priorities, several clean air, clean energy priorities, um, whereas Ranking Member Brady would probably be content if these went away and were not extended into the future. So you may recall that last year, um, when he, he was then Chairman Brady, he went alone on a bill rather than a broad negotiated package, um, which extended only two of around the 30 expired credits. So that wasn't very well received. Um, but we're hopeful this year that there might be a chance for a broader negotiated tax agreement. Um, and with that, I will pitch it over to Michael Baker so that he can kind of give uh, an update on the outlook for tax extenders and what we're hearing. In and seeing about an end of year pitch. Great, uh, thanks Allison, uh, I, I appreciate it. And uh, Ken, thanks for uh, putting on this webinar today. Uh, my name is Michael Baker, I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs uh, for the National Propane Gas Association. Uh, we represent uh, just under 3,000 members. Uh, we are in uh, every state and every county in the US. We have a, a broad reach. And I guess kind of before I get started, I just want to, I know Alice and I have worked very hard on the alternative fuel tax credit, and I think uh, Allison herself has worked harder than anyone else. And so uh, just want to thank her for her efforts. I know most days it's kind of a, a thankless job, um, and a lot of people stand to uh, gain for the work uh, that her and others are doing. So uh, thanks to Allison uh, on all our hard work. Um, kind of looking at the outlook here for uh, tax extenders as we get close to the end of the year. Um, I think, you know, as Ken had mentioned a couple times, and uh, as I'm sure everyone has seen on the TV, uh, impeachment proceedings have completely dominated the news cycle. Uh, they've dominated uh, the legislative uh, calendar. Um, and as this kind of moves into uh, uh, what we expect will be a Senate trial at the beginning of next year, just kind of still unknown how um, all this will impact end of year negotiations. Um, the good news, uh, as Allison had kind of uh, alluded to earlier, um, uh, we have really uh, convinced Congress that um, a lot of these tax provisions and the work that we've done on the alternative fuel tax credit, we've convinced Congress that uh, this is actually good policy. Um, and I think that is the most challenging part. And so, um, you know, the reward of that is kind of seeing uh, our provisions included in um, bills in the House and uh, in the Senate as well. And so, there really is kind of bipartisan support um, for tax extenders. Um, so that's kind of the good news. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty, though, as to kind of how an end of year uh, deal might uh, materialize. Um, I think stakeholders in the House and the Senate um, have their, uh, they each have kind of their own bargaining chips. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we know that uh, negotiations have uh, really picked up this week. Um, and uh, those stakeholders in the last slide have uh, really began talking about what, what a final deal might look like. And so that's, that's a positive sign. Uh, however, we uh, still have kind of no news yet on, on a final deal. Um, but it, uh, as far as kind of how uh, we can get uh, tax extenders uh, across the line at the end of the year, uh, I think the best way to do that is through uh, government spending legislation. And um, I think um, those negotiations are going well uh, and they are showing kind of signs of light. And I, I think there is a re real opportunity here to move forward. Uh, again, no no guarantees, and you know we're still kind of in a, a a coin flip or maybe even less situation. But I think seeing a, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for the end of the year. Great, awesome, okay. thanks, Michael. Yep, yep thanks, Ken. Um, uh, thank you, and I, I'm going to now uh, turn it over to Genevieve Cullen from the Electric Drive Transportation Association, who's going to talk a little bit about the um, status of various uh, electric vehicle uh, and charging uh, tax incentives. So thanks, Genevieve. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, and uh, thanks for having me today. Again, it's uh, I'm Genevieve Cullen. I'm the president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. Um, and we represent uh, the entire value chain of electric transportation. So that's uh, uh, vehicle, electricity, uh, infrastructure, and component uh, suppliers uh, in the uh, electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicle spaces. Um, so we have a we have a pretty broad mandate, and uh, we look to advance um, you know federal funding in the uh, in the form of. R D and D support that in the Department of Energy's programs and appropriations, which I know that you all will be will talk about a little bit later on. Um, and we also are looking at um, the conversation uh, about uh, an infrastructure bill or a highway bill to look at building out uh, electric drive infrastructure and whatever the next uh, effort on infrastructure is, and. Uh, on to the topic of the day, um, the end of year package, um, whatever that means. Um, you know, there are there are a suite of, of electric drive tax incentives that are important to uh, to the industry and to EDTA. Um, uh, obviously, the, there are the uh, there are two tax incentives that uh, fall within that terrible purgatory of the extenders package that Allison was referring to. Um, that is the, um, for the people who, who like their code references, that's the Section 30B fuel cell electric vehicle credit and the Section 30C alternative fuel vehicle refueling property credit. We just call it the infrastructure credit because uh, that's awkward, that phrasing. Um, uh, and that, that that credit applies to all alternative fuels. Um, and, uh, you know, as a... Um, you know, all I think everybody on the phone has been um, working on on um, and extending that particular credit, um, and we have been working with the with this larger coalition on um, creating um, impetus for moving an extenders package, um, as was previously discussed. Um, in addition to those um, extenders, which um, you know, the the game is to keep the Keep the credits alive while you're trying to maybe um, fix them going forward. Um, so to that end, we are also talking about uh, the Driving America Forward Act, which is a, a bill which has been introduced in the House and Senate and was incorporated in the Green Act, also um, previously referenced, that would uh, create some room under these 30 D as in dog um, or drive, I guess would be more appropriate. Um, uh, tax incentive for for plug-in electric drive vehicles, and uh, that bill would, um, they, as you may or may not know, that bill uh, the, that credit um, begins to phase out 
on a per manufacturer basis when the manufacturer um, certifies the sale of 200,000 vehicles. And uh, GM and Tesla have already hit that. Nissan, Ford are not far behind. Um, so we're looking to, uh, we have built an industry consensus around a, a fix to create more room under the cap. Um, and to shorten the phase out period going forward. The Driving America Forward Act would also extend the, on a, a, a parallel basis, the, the fuel cell electric vehicle credit. So uh, that bill um, has 135 co sponsors in the House. Um, it has seven co sponsors in the Senate, um, which including uh, two Republicans and an independent. So it's a bipartisan bill in the Senate. Um, and we have um, the leadership in both year-end uh, tax, tax package. Um, so we are we are hoping to um, to move forward that fix. If in fact a tax extender bill moves, which is in, again dependent on whether. Uh, Congress can come to an agreement um, on a, uh, FY20 appropriations, which would be the vehicle for all of these things. Um, uh, so we, uh, we, we are pushing forward on all of those fronts. Um, and we also are looking, we will be looking um, uh, at a, in the longer term um, at, uh, at updating the alternative fuel infrastructure credit, um, which um, as you know, um, was written in 2005, and um, actually when it was, um, it didn't even include electricity until 2008, and uh, um, it actually, it doesn't uh, contemplate where electric charging is, is headed, where that market is really headed, and the emphasis on on um, on DC fast charge, and even the change in what DC fast charge looks like, um, people, you know, Two years ago, when you said DC fast charge, they said, ah, it's, it's 50 kilowatts. Um, and now um, folks are looking at 150 to 350 kilowatts for fast charge. So the costs associate with that um, increase um, in direct proportion to the amount of kilowatts. So the, um, we're going to be looking at um, updating that credit moving forward. Um, and I will just wrap up by saying, uh, you know, to the previous speakers, again, um, you know, I think there is, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, there's a lot of um, antagonism um, on, the, on the Hill these days, but uh, we feel if uh, if they can come to an agreement um, on a year-end tax package, we're in a good, we're in a good position to be included. Um, and that's all I got. So thank you. Great, thanks Genevieve. I'm gonna stop here and see if anyone in the audience has questions. And you can either type your questions in. I don't see any typed questions yet. Um, you can also raise your hand. You can check the little hand box. Um, so does anybody have questions? I know everybody's very interested in the tax incentives. Does anybody have questions uh, for our for our speakers on the on the tax incentives? Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question. Um, can you and uh, you know start start with uh, Allison and then Michael and uh, um, Genevieve can add into it. But um, uh, you know we're going to have 250 meetings on the Hill um, in February with congressional offices. Can you talk about um, give us number one talk about the importance of these meetings, even even if the extenders, if we're fortunate enough to see them pass, and obviously if they don't pass at the end of the year, um, it becomes even more urgent to get them extended. And if you can give folks any advice um, for how to be uh, most effective in talking about uh, these incentives with their members of Congress. Um, Allison, you want to take first crack? Sure. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, either way, if we get the tax credit extended at the end of this year or if it goes into the first quarter of next year and we still don't have it extended, either way, we'll still need to have advocates speaking with Congress about the longer term certainty. 
for these credits. If we do get an extension, it'll likely just be a two year through 2019. So we'll be back at square one, unfortunately. Um, there was a talk a couple months ago about a small chance they could be extended through 2020, but I don't see that as being very likely. So when you're in and having those conversations, uh, I think one of the messages that's been very well received, uh, particularly by Democrats, is to remind them that non-taxable entities can take credits such as the AFTC, that that really helps to drive sustainability investments. Uh, but in order to make some of those sustainability investments, you really need to have uh, a longer term runway for those credits and they need to be a prospective extension for a longer period of time rather than um, kind of a backwards extension for shorter periods of time. So what you're saying, I just want to clarify, Allison, um, you're saying the likelihood is um, if the extenders get a Prove they will be for retroactively for 2018 and 2019. So when people are here in Washington, even if that's done, um, we won't have anything in place for 2020 going forward, right? Correct. I haven't heard anything that makes me believe that we might luck out in getting a 2020 extension. Um, maybe someone else has heard otherwise, but even if it did go through 2020, I still think we would be having that same conversation because that would only be um, kind of one you're looking forward and a lot of people have already planned investments for 2020 and set their budgets. And so um, they've likely already done their business cases for fleet turnover and investment. So we'll need to be talking about 2021 and beyond. Gotcha. Um, Michael, anything else you want to add to advice for people coming to DC? Uh, yeah, I think just in general, um, fly-ins are, are really helpful. Uh, you know, our organization has an annual fly-in that's really helpful for my uh, advocacy efforts. And I think, you know, as much as congressional offices love to hear from lobbyists like myself, it's the real stakeholders um, that bring value. Uh, so whether you have uh, businesses or organizations in, in certain states or congressional districts, um, it, that's kind of uh, what I think helps move the needle. And then I, I, I would also say that, um, you know, when you're in these meetings and you're taking meetings on the Hill, you really have to make a clear ask and you have to tell people why, um, why uh, they should help you. And I think, you know, as we're talking about tax credits, um, you know, when we're talking about the alternative fuel tax credit, uh, we have fleet managers who are making uh, you know, multi-million dollar decisions over uh, many years moving forward and um, having these this legislation in place uh, is likely to change uh, behavior, change uh, the way that people, uh, you know, purchase fleets. And if you're talking about, uh, you know, transit buses or school buses, you know, this is the this is the type of thing that you know uh, an alternative fuel tax credit is what is going to help uh, those fleet managers uh, make a decision to uh, buy an alternative fuel vehicle over a, a standard uh, standard diesel vehicle, which provides a, a number of different benefits, which we don't have to get into. But I think really making an ask and telling them why it's important that's that's kind of uh, my input there, Ken. Great, thanks, Michael and Genevieve. Um, well, I guess um, I I would second all that's that's been said, and I would you know based um, your Hill Day has has proven to be pretty effective um, in the past. And the uh, you know the the Clean Cities programs um, have a, for some reason are always a target, and that uh, this coalition and 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 others has been really effective in not only um keeping you know funding for for clean cities but to making it like that it's it's an increasing amount of funding so um you're doing something right already um on the on the tax message um you know again uh they uh, as you know that that's it's absolutely um legislators want to hear why um any particular policy matters to um, to their constituents. So the more concrete um, folks can be about the value uh, of the, um, you know, federal investment in the form of tax incentives, uh, the, the better it is. And, and for for uh, electric vehicles and infrastructure, you know, whether that's, you know, um, you know, for consumers or um, for, for fleets or um, municipalities, um, you know what is that value? It's helping um, 
folks access, you know, uh, vehicles that are cheaper to drive. It's it's uh, stimulating the creation of, of jobs and manufacturing in their district, or um, it's uh, or you know, um, increasing, uh, enhancing air quality uh, in someone's district. So I think the more um, concrete um, and to your your particular, you know the constituents benefit, the better. Um, we can all make macro arguments about, um, you know, U.S. competitiveness and, and, and climate change, um, which are, are true and compelling, but I think um, what really moves the needle is, um, you know, what's happening at home and why it matters to those folks. Great. All right. Thank you all. Um, great discussion and update on the tax incentives. We're now going to move to the renewable fuel standard. Um, and I'm going to introduce Paul Winters, who's with the National Biodiesel Board, who's going to give us an update on the renewable fuel standard. And I would also be remiss. I just want to emphasize that um, all of this discussion on tax incentives also impacts the the biofuels and biodiesel industry because there's a very important biodiesel tax incentive that's expired and would be included in any uh, tax extender package as well. So, uh, Paul, thanks for being here and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, as Ken said, I, I am the uh, Public Affairs Director with the National Biodiesel Board. We are the uh, largest U.S.-based trade association for the biodiesel and renewable diesel industry. We include uh, a lot of the feedstock producers within our membership, so state soybean associations, uh, some of the rendering companies, and uh, some of the other crops are members of ours. Uh, but we are, we represent about 100 companies, large and small. About two thirds of our biodiesel producer members are very small companies. They uh, produce anywhere from half a million gallons a year to 20 million gallons a year. And um, so they re rely on both the tax credit and the renewable fuel standard to help them compete with uh, petroleum diesel fuel out there in the marketplace. So if you've been watching the renewable fuel standard this year, you've probably got whiplash or, or uh, you may think the world has completely turned upside down here. The In June, President Trump announced that uh, he would have the EPA approve year-round uh, E15 fuel. And while, as he was out in Iowa making that announcement, he got uh, an earful about small refinery exemptions. The small refinery exemptions have just been the biggest story of the year. But uh, the biofuel industry as a whole was, was very pleased with the E15 announcement. It's, it's very specific to ethanol, but uh, the um, facility that uh, President Trump visited was owned by Kevin Ross. Kevin Ross is also uh, a member, is also a soybean grower and uh, also um, represents a company that is a member of NVB. So he knows the entire fuel industry, biofuel industry. A month after that announcement, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency put out the proposal for the 2020 volumes of the RFS. And that proposal was just a flatline carbon copy of the numbers from 2019, essentially. And I, you can see that in the table here. Um, since 2017, the numbers, the volumes that EPA has been proposing have been pretty flat. They're not allowing advanced and biomass-based diesel to grow. The outlier in that uh, was 2019, last year. 
the statute had a 500 million gallon boost uh, in the advanced biofuel category. Uh, EPA did not have a good excuse to waive it, even though they searched for one. But uh, essentially, they they included that 500 million gallon boost last year, and they primarily gave all of that growth to the bio biomass-based diesel industry. They uh, boosted the 2020 volume for, for biomass-based diesel by 330 million gallons. And because there's uh, because the um, biomass-based diesel earns one at least one and a half RINs per gallon, that meant the entire 500 million gallon value went into the biomass-based diesel category. That was a that was a huge boost for our companies. Um, and they they did in fact boost production in 2018 by that 300 million gallon uh, requirement. So then it was a little bit of a shock when EPA came back this year and, and simply kept the volumes flat and the exact same thing that they had done back in 2017. Uh, it, in addition to, to just flatlining growth, um, EPA uh, ignored essentially a court order from 2016. Too much time had elapsed and it would be a hardship to oil producers, oil refiners, to, to include that boost. So that was, um, that was a pretty bold signal that uh, EPA was simply going to ignore a court order. All in all, it's, it's kind of a worrying signal for the future of the RFS. Uh, the, the, um, the congressionally set volumes only run through 2022. We're almost there at the end. Uh, there is one final 500 million gallon increase for overall advanced biofuels left in that congressional uh, table for 2022. And you know the signal that we're getting from EPA is that they intend to simply simply keep volumes flat into the future. However, uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So the big problem this entire year, the conversation has been around small refinery exemptions. So EPA announced it proposed its rule right before the July 4th holiday for 2020, and then a month later, on August 9th at 6 o'clock in the evening, EPA issued 31 small refinery exemptions. That was uh, almost as many as they had uh, issued the year before. It came in, in spite of the earful that uh, President Trump had received while he was announcing the E15 uh, approval. And it represented a severe hit to the, to the entire biofuel industry, but in, in particular to the biodiesel industry. Between 2013 and 2015, uh, EPA handed out just a, a handful of these small refinery exemptions. It was seven or eight every single year. Uh, some of them they handed out in, before they announced the rule. Some of them they handed out after the rule. When they hand when they give out these exemptions before they set the annual rule, then the the rule has a mechanism for accounting for them. And the ones they were were handing out after the rule had been set uh, were ne were never counted, but. Up until 2015, they were kind of negligible. Uh, then in 2016, uh, EPA handed out 19 of these exemptions retroactively. 
and they've been increasing the number that they're granting every year, and they've all been retroactive. Uh, that has simply undercut demand for biofuels. It's been equal to about 4 billion gallons of biofuels overall. At least a quarter of that is biodiesel and renewable diesel. And that's because uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel uh, represent at least 90% of the overall advanced volumes. It's, uh, EPA's actions are simply encouraging more and more refiners to request the petitions. So Paul, I have a question for you. When these uh, small refineries uh, make these petitions, are, do, are for how long do they get the exemption? Is that a one-year exemption? Do they have to renew it every year, or is it a multi-year or forever? How does that work? So it, it is intended to be a um, a one-year exemption. The refiners are supposed to indicate when they petition uh, when they expect to be able to comply with the program again. And they're, you know, they're supposed to have a plan in place for when they'll, they'll no longer need the exemption. Uh, but the way that EPA is handing them out these, uh, the past few years, they are simply um, renewing it every year uh, and um, encouraging more and more people and uh, to to apply for them gotcha so, so in effect they're they're just rubber stamping the renewal basically yes um epa also kind of protects these the decisions on the on the exemptions as confidential business information ones we have seen um Uh, you know, EPA granted a, a an exemption to a, a Hawaiian refiner, uh, and their reasoning was that the refiner was based in Hawaii, essentially, so that it was at a competitive disadvantage because of that location. It, just to put it in perspective, um, you know, a small refinery by EPA's definition is it can process up to 75,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, in a year, that's more than 860 million gallons of gasoline and diesel, not counting other products that come from the from the oil. The RFS obligation for biomass-based diesel, which is just over 2%. If, when applied to that 860 million gallons, that would be about 20 million gallons of biodiesel. So just one exemption can completely wipe out the market for one small biodiesel producer. Wow. And as a result, as a result, we've seen at least 10 biodiesel producers shut down during this year. Some of that, some of that instability is is. Um, coming from the lack of the lapse of the tax credit as well. But anyway, the, the, the backlash against the small refinery exemptions was pretty severe. It was the entire biofuel industry united together. And um, we, you know, the protest got to the president. Uh, it involved USDA and EPA on October 4th, um, after several several tweets from the president saying he was he was trying to make the biofuel producers happy, uh, on October 4th, uh, White House, USDA, and EPA released a proposal and said they were gonna uh, they were gonna make sure that the RFS volumes were whole, that they would. If they uh, handed out the small refinery exemptions, they would account for them in the annual rules beginning in 2020. And they would use an, a, an average of the exemptions handed out over the past three years 
as the basis for making that estimate. Two weeks after that, when EPA actually proposed its rule, it was a little bit different from what had been advertised. Uh, EPA was promising that they would limit the number of exemptions they handed out, and then uh, their estimate uh, was based on their intention to do to limit the future exemptions. So uh, EPA is asking everyone to trust them now and uh, wait until 2020 to see if, if their promise uh, to limit small refinery exemptions holds. So that's still uh, causing some consternation. We're about, we expect uh, the final 2020 rule by the end of this year, including some estimate of small refinery exemptions. Um, simply getting that estimate is, is a win in general, but um, we do certainly want it to be the best estimate possible. possible. So Ken, if you can uh, go to the next slide. I'll just cover the RFS reset briefly. So as I said, uh, the statutory volumes in, for the RFS are, are running out by 2022. Uh, EPA has also triggered a reset because of the, the waivers it gave out through for 2016 and 2017. They, they have now uh, triggered this uh, provision in the statute where they can rewrite the congressional tables for, and we're talking about 2021 and 2022 at this point. Uh, there's a, a well-established process that for reviewing the implementation of the RFS program and applying that to, to future um, volumes for the RFS, they've been doing this for the biomass-based diesel category since 2013, so they, it's a well-established process. July, at the, the exact same time that they uh, proposed the 2020 rule. So it's been sitting at the White House uh, at the OMB since that time. Uh, part of the, uh, the deal uh, that the White House announced uh, with the USDA and EPA um, in October was to reconsider that proposal. Um, no one has, it's never been released publicly, but we've certainly heard from USDA that it, it is, um, not favorable to the biofuel industry and, and would not support future growth. So we're still waiting on that process to, to play out. And with that, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, Paul, the same the same question, and you can give a partial answer now. But I'd like to talk more with you as we get. Um, prepared for people to come to DC in February. Um, it sounds like this is a really important time for the biofuels industry um, and that us having folks in, in town could be a great opportunity to amplify your message. Um, so anything you wanna say that you can, excuse me uh, for, uh, my animal, um, but anything you want to add to you know the importance of the time and what value we can add in February and um, uh, any thoughts to how to how to be most effective? Yes, I'll start with the the general. Um, when you're visiting the offices, uh, it's a, an opportunity to create a relationship with the, the office and the staff. Uh, invite them, invite the Congress member to, uh, to visit your facility, um, sit down for a round table with, with uh, your employees or with uh, other um, 
part business partners in the community and have a discussion, educate the uh, the staff over time. Uh, don't treat the fly-in as a one-off event. Uh, on, in terms of the RFS, there's um, there's a there's some role that Congress can play. Uh, Congress oversees EPA. Congress has uh, the authority to to direct the agency to set higher volumes in the future. And certainly, they have um, have the resources to oversee. EPA's use of the small refinery exemptions. Uh, on the tax credit, uh, you know, unfortunately, by I think February, uh, this will still be an issue in one way or another. Uh, even if there's an extension for uh, 2018 and 2019, there would still be 2020 um, waiting for us. And that's, uh, you know, uh, certainly an, an opportunity to, to remind members of Congress what the what the impact of the lapsed tax credit is. Uh, like I said, we've, we've already had 10 biodiesel producers uh, stop production. Right now, that uh, this is the traditional annual time for biodiesel producers to, to shut down and do maintenance because uh, the market is lower in the winter. And um, I know there are some biodiesel producers who, who are going to be questioning whether they restart uh, after their maintenance period. So um, we may be seeing more shutdowns uh, as a result of uh, just a lack of growth in the RFS and uncertainty about the tax credit. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Um, we're now going to turn to infrastructure, and I'm going to introduce Patrick Arness. And Patrick is with the uh, Edison Electric Institute. Um, Patrick, thanks for being here. Good. Yeah. Th thank you, Ken. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Patrick Arness, I'm the uh, Director of Government Relations for the Edison Electric Institute. We represent all the investor-owned utilities uh, across the U.S. that provide gas and electric to about. 220 million people uh, nationwide, all 50 states, plus the District of Columbia. Uh, our members uh, collectively are investing about 100 to 120 billion dollars each year in infrastructure improvements, um, transmission and distribution, um, and that includes on uh, transportation infrastructure side as well. So we, um, as I like to remind most folks, we we do not make cars, we don't make charging stations, um, but we are uh, eager to help uh, clean city folks, transportation authorities, um, the OEMs, anyone else um, who wants to build out infrastructure or who wants to put in these charging or fueling stations to help them do it as, as cost effectively as possible. So from our perspective, there are a few things that are out there that are of interest. Um, I think the one that's progressed uh, furthest at this point is the Senate uh, Environment and Public Works Committee legislation that passed out at the end of July, reauthorizing surface transportation programs. Uh, the last one was the bill that was the FAST Act uh, about five years ago. Um, the programs are set to expire at the end of September next year. Um, the bill passed out of committee, as you can see, unanimously. Um, it was significant primarily because this was the first time that a surface transportation bill had included a climate title. Now, there's always been sort of cool climate components to a transportation bill, but um, this was more specifically spelled out. Um, and you'll see in the next slide uh, a few of those things um, of importance. Uh, for the alternative fuel infrastructure um, piece. That includes uh, provision for a billion dollars uh, over five years on competitive grants uh, to build out hydrogen, natural gas, and electric vehicle fueling infrastructure um, along 
the national highway system uh, establishes a new program for um, to reduce truck idling and port electrification uh, again over five years so a little more than 300 million reauthorizes the DERA program and also sets aside um, additional funding for states to reduce their mobile emissions um, all things that uh, theoretically would go toward alternative fuel vehicle deployment and uh, related infrastructure so those those are positive developments um, of course, in the Senate, there's also the Senate Finance Committee that would work on funding um, that hasn't taken any action, and neither has the Senate Commerce Committee or the Senate Banking Committee, uh, which has jurisdiction over the FTA. Uh, I think we're, we're hopeful that things pick up in the new year, but uh, as, as a handful of folks have alluded to, I think we need to see what happens, one, with the uh, potential continuing resolution and tax package and how long the Senate uh, impeachment proceedings uh, occur as well. Um, on the House side, uh, the House T&I Committee, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, um, is in the process of drafting its bill. Um, over here on, uh, over there on the, on the House side, it's, it's just the T&I Committee and then Ways and means that provides the financing. Um, they are hoping to have something wrapped up by the end of the year in terms of a draft. Uh, unclear when that might be released. I think their goal is to try and take action on it in the first quarter of next year. Um, my guess would be that they at least match what the Senate EPW committee did in terms of addressing uh, clean transportation and, and uh, resilient uh, transportation um, and climate just broadly throughout their bill, given the dynamics um, uh, politically on the House side, I think they, they feel compelled to be a little more robust. Same issue on the House side as the Senate in terms of how you pay for those things um, and to the political question it's an election year presidential election year often bogs things down um, and sort of uh, scares folks away potentially from making deals that they otherwise would be inclined to um, I, you know we're still up there advocating for them to take action I think a lot of members would like to uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done um, on the, on the surface transportation bill at this point. A couple other things that are um, at least being considered on the, on the House side or introduced um, or soon to be introduced, you know, there's the, the Energy and Commerce Lift America Act that includes uh, Clean Cities reauthorization, includes funding um, for uh, clean school buses, is, includes funding for for DERA port electrification. So there's some interest at the committee um, in addressing infrastructure from from the energy and commerce side. Um, in addition, one other sort of unknown right now, but but soon to be released um, again, probably by the end of the year. The energy and commerce Democrats have announced uh, that they are working on a. a economy-wide net zero bill that would touch on uh, the industrial sector, the power sector, and the transportation sector. Uh, I think it's, it's unclear at this point to what extent they would uh, simply address transportation from just the, like a carbon intensity side uh, of things and, and pure emissions um, and whether or not in, in, in addition to addressing lower no emission vehicles um, in terms of transportation emissions, how much they pair that with the infrastructure side, I think most everyone agrees is needed to help meet uh, increasing demand of, of fuel cell, natural gas, propane, EVs, whatever it may be, uh, to meet the needs of those, those vehicles as they uh, continue to be deployed uh, more uh, commercially uh, available scale. 
Uh, so those are a few of the things that we're checking from an infrastructure perspective. Again, a lot to be seen. A lot will be dictated by what happens at the end of the year here. Um, but yeah, we're, we're tracking a lot of uh, what the other speakers are have commented on as well. So that's uh, that's a lay of the land from, from my side um, as of now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Patrick. So I, would you say it's pretty safe to say, I mean, with the with the transportation bill expiring, um, that there's likely it doesn't mean they have to get it done next year. And obviously the election year complicates it. But I would think there's a pretty good chance they're going to make significant prog progress next year. And if it doesn't get done in 2020, it's likely to happen for sure in the next Congress, don't you think, in terms of transportation infrastructure overall? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, I think, right before they passed the FAST Act, they had done a, a, a sort of clean again of surface transportation programs um, because they couldn't strike a deal. Uh, that's historically, it's been a pretty bipartisan issue. Um, these are not normal times. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there have been some other things that, that have moved through Congress that have traditionally been bipartisan that a more um, uh, partisan effort, unfortunately. So I, I think it depends what kind of momentum can come from the House. Um, I think that might dictate the tone going forward. Um, the Senate, uh, as indicated by the at least by the the committee vote, is in a much better place in terms of um, being bipartisanship at this point. Great, thanks. So we're running up to an hour, so I'm going to go real quickly through the next pieces, and then we will do another webinar in um, uh, early January to get into more detail on some of the things we didn't get to do today. Um, but anyway, briefly on update on funding. Um, uh, as everybody said, um, there's there's a good possibility that uh, a funding bill will get done um, before the Christmas holidays. Right now, in terms of clean cities funding, um, what you have is the House, uh, the Senate provided the same amount as last year, which is 37.8 million. Um, and then the House added in another four and a half million. So we're uh, supporting the House number. Um, we're supporting the House language um, that uh, encourages. There can be more recipients. Both the House and Senate have language that the competitive grants should include at least one Clean Cities Coalition as a partner. Um, we are opposing language that's in the Senate version of the bill, which would provide funding, uh, which would encourage the competitive grants to go to states with the where uh, um, the transportation sector is responsible for the largest portion of both energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we oppose that because the Clean Cities program is a national program, and we think, um, you know, all coalitions, all organizations, and all states should be eligible um, to get the grants, not just those um, uh, in the high emission states. Um, and then the Senate includes some language which we're supporting, which would include uh, an additional 20 million for up to four electric vehicle community partner projects. And it would be um, to help uh, communities implement plans to deploy more electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. Um, in terms of the DERA program, um, last year, the number was 87 million. Uh, the House uh, has reduced its number to 55 million, uh, with 70% of the grants going to non-attainment areas. 
and the Senate is up close to last year's number, so we're supporting the higher number there. Um, and then in terms of the um, FY 2021 appropriations process, that's going to be starting to be kicked off when um, folks are in D.C. in February um, with the president. The president's supposed to propose his budget in February, and then the appropriations will, process will kick into gear. Um, uh, one of the key things, again, will be to find your members' appropriations request process, and then um, we will get requests into various members to get them to encourage the subcommittees to support our priorities again this year. Um, I want to touch briefly. Um, many of you know that um, the Federal Highway Administration has um, stopped funding uh, clean vehicle projects through the CMAC program due to uh, um, Buy America policies in the past. They, on a quarterly basis, they would grant waivers to projects as long as the vehicles um, were assembled in, in, in America, um, uh, which was a compromise that we struck with the uh, previous administration that was working well. Um, the House and Senate appropriations bills both have some language that provide minor improvements, but they don't really fix the issue going forward. Um, and we've had extensive discussions with the House Transportation Committee about addressing this um, in any House transportation infrastructure legislation. So we're, we're, we continue to work on this, um, and it can, it's still a problem. But um, again, we're going to need your help going forward to uh, attempt to, to fix this. And we'll be talking with um, congressional offices in February again. Uh, about this topic. Um, uh, and then finally, um, I just want to mention for those of you interested in the Clean Cities program, we are um, working on an authorizing bill for the Clean Cities program. The program is authorized um, through the Energy Policy Act of 1992, but it's not authorized specifically in the name of Clean Cities. And we wanted to change that. Um, and um, we've been working with the House Energy Committee. Congressman McEachin from Virginia has agreed to be our lead sponsor. We're still working to get a Republican lead sponsor. Um, and the, the bill would um, provide authorization levels of beginning at 50 million a year and going up over time. Uh, and then it also prescribes where the funding would go each year so that 30% of funding would go to directly support the coalitions, 20% would be for DOE technical and other support, and 50% would be for um, competitive deployment grants. Um, so with that, I'm going to go one, check one more time and see if there are any other questions that are out there. Um, I do not see any questions. Um, I want to thank our sponsors again. I want to thank all our panelists. You did a great job. We really appreciate the time you gave and the great work that you all are doing, um, both supporting Clean Cities, but also supporting the industry um, across the board. Um, and again, I want to remind people to please uh, register for the uh, Energy Independence Summit coming up in February. Um, and uh, um, here's people contact information. We will have the recording and the slides up on our website, and we'll send you all a link to that. Um, but feel free to reach out to people. Um, we thank you for your support um, and have a great holiday and we'll see you in DC in February. Thanks everybody. Thanks Ken. Thanks Ken.